welcome uh, to this uh, first of uh, four lectures on African American history in Maryland and beyond. Uh, I just wanted to uh, explain a little bit how this uh, series came about. Last summer, we had uh, brief but honest conversations uh, with our staff and faculty who shared in a forum like this one, their own experiences of what they worried about when they were uh, going home about their families and what their parents and their neighbors uh, said when they were diagnosed with cancer. And that opened the possibility to really uh, learn more about um, the history of uh, Baltimore and Maryland as it relates to African-American history, and in particular in gaps that maybe um, in um, the knowledge of those of us who are on the faculty and trainees who've come from far away to take care of patients and do research here, but may not have had a chance to meet um, Maryland from this angle. And we're privileged to have Dr. Northington Gamble lead us in that uh, discussion this morning. Just a couple of announcements. We're gonna come back at four o'clock to have a smaller group conversation that will be led by our staff and faculty um, uh, to um, <clears throat> reflect on Dr. Northington Gamble's lecture and some of the readings. The readings are on the bottom of the announcement and if you need them, please let me or uh, one of us uh, know. Uh, we may have room for uh, questions at the end and feel free to send that by the chat. We will have room for questions at the end. and. Um, if we can't get to your question, we'll make sure to save it and include it in our afternoon discussion. This morning's lecture will be recorded and the recording uh, will be made available within uh, Johns Hopkins and potentially beyond. And we'll keep you posted on those uh, sites and so you can share them uh, widely. Um, and uh, the discussion, however, will not be recorded. Um, I want to uh, come back and make sure to welcome in particular those of you who may be joining us from outside the Cancer Center. And those of you who are friends and family of, uh, of us who work here who may be joining us from the community. Without further ado, then let me introduce Dr. Vanessa Northington Gamble. She's an authority on um, the history of, of American uh, medicine, especially as it relates to race. She is uh, the University Professor of Medical Humanities at the George Washington University. She is the first woman and African American to hold that endowed faculty position. She's also Professor of Health Policy in the Milken Institute School of Public Health and Professor of American Studies in the Columbian College of Arts and Sciences. Dr. Gamble also holds an adjunct appointment at the School of Nursing in the University of Pennsylvania. Her career is marked by efforts to promote equity and justice in medicine and public health. Dr. Northington Gamble is a physician, a scholar, and an activist, and an internationally recognized authority on race and ethnic disparities in health and healthcare, public health ethics, and uh, bioethics. And I think uh, from the size of our audience today, you'll see the, the wide reach of her scholarship. She's author of severally, several widely acclaimed publications on the history of race and racism. Um, public service has been a hallmark of her career. I'll just uh, mention one, um, including the, the chairing of the committee uh, that uh, eventually uh, campaigned and successfully obtained an apology from President Clinton in 1997 for the United States Public Health Syphilis Study at Tuskegee. She's a member of the National Academy of, Mem uh, of Medicine as well as the National Academy of Sciences and a fellow at the Hastings Center. Uh, she's a proud native of West Philadelphia did her MD PhD at the University of Pennsylvania and is perhaps one of the first uh, physician social scientists um, in uh, the MSTP program there and potentially around the country. Uh, her title today is uh, timely, 
and perhaps considered <clears throat> urgent as we continue this conversation at our cancer center and in our city. Trust, trustworthiness, and Tuskegee in the age of COVID-19. Welcome, Vanessa. We really look forward to your talk. Oh, thank you, Mary, for such a, a, a lovely and generous uh, introduction. And also, uh, I want to thank you for coming up with this idea about getting people to understand the history of uh, African Americans, not just in uh, Baltimore, um, but around the country. So I'm really excited about um, uh, kicking this off, and that puts the pressure on me that I have to, you know, be do this well so that uh, you, you know people you know, uh, will come back for this. And um, as Mary said, there will be time for questions uh, um, at at the end of, of my uh, presentation. So what I want to do is to trace the history of the United States public health syphilis study at Tuskegee. And um, I, I want to start with a, a nomic, you know, the name here. Most people know it as the Tuskegee syphilis study. I call it the United States Public Health Syphilis Study at Tuskegee. And the reason I call it that is that a lot of times people don't know uh, that the Public Health Service was involved in the syphilis study. And I'll also talk later about what were some of the good things that Tuskegee Uni Institute, now Tuskegee University did in terms of the health and healthcare of uh, African-Americans. Uh, I also want to analyze the legacy of the syphilis study in healthcare and medical research in African American communities, including contemporary discussions of COVID-19 and vaccines. Explain research on race, trust, trustworthiness in healthcare and clinical research, and then identify some of the factors, I think, in the development of trustworthy relationships with the African American community. Mm -hmm. So one of, the, one of the reasons I came up with uh, this topic is that with COVID-19, there have been many articles, and this is just uh, a sampling of articles talking about COVID vaccine trials and uh, African-Americans, uh, how um, Black doctors want to vet the vaccine process because they're worried about years of historical um, racism uh, in the medical community and how um, uh, people of color don't uh, uh, trust um, 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 physicians and research, and that in order that the also underscore the importance of having um, African Americans in COVID-19 vaccine trials, but concerns about uh, trust. One of the things that many of these articles talk about are, are the syphilis study. And um, for like, we want to study you, uh, we, you know, concerns about being guinea pigs. Uh, but at the same time, many of these articles about the syphilis study, I think overstate uh, some of the issues around the syphilis study. And also there are some errors. And so I thought that this would be a good time in the age of COVID-19 to look at the syphilis study. What was it? about uh, um, and what are some of the myths that continue about the syphilis study. So the syphilis study uh, went from 1932 uh, to 1972 and it involved approximately 427 black men from Macon County, Alabama. Uh, Tuskegee is the county seat uh, in Macon, many of whom were poor. And I want to underscore many of whom were poor because there are, um, uh, there's almost this mantra, these poor uh, sharecroppers. Many were poor, many were sharecroppers, but not all. And the reason I have co some concerns about this is that it, it negates their individual histories. It negates that there were that you know, many of them could read, uh, and so that they were not, you know, these illiterate sharecroppers, and that their family stories here. And so, I mean, I think that that is an important part because it also underscores, I think, that the men were in vulnerable situations that they themselves might not necessarily been vulnerable. Um, and they reportedly had latent syphilis. 
um, but there was uh, some sloppy science. So we're not sure. And so there were 185 men uh, without the disease and 12 uh, who had in the control group were switched to the syphilitic group. The other thing I want to point out, it was not the Tuskegee Airmen who um, were involved in the syphilis study. Uh, part of the problem, some people think it was uh, the Airmen, is that HBO did two um, uh, uh, dramas on uh, Tuskegee, one on the Airmen, one on the syphilis study, and Lawrence Fishburne was in both of them. And so people, you know, like kind of conflated. So it was not the airmen. And not all the men were, may have been in late latency. And because of that, there are wives and children and two grandchildren that tested positive for syphilis. Now, this is the crux of the syphilis study. The men were told that they were receiving treatment throughout the study. And that's, and, that, and that's critical, that they were told that they were being, uh, that they were receiving treatment. And perhaps 54% of the men received small amounts of some of the heavy metal treatments at the beginning of the study. And later uh, uh, people received penicillin from other studies. So that uh, there is some, um, um, some, so some of the men might've been under treated. Uh, it was originally thought that between 28 to 100 men died as a direct result of the, of the syphilis. Now it's believed to be about 16, but it's difficult to come up with an exact number because of a lack of autopsies. Um, it did not, and I say directly as a result of their syphilis. Um, and the thing is that reports and medical studies uh, records reveal that in the, up until the last years of the study, those who had syphilis had, uh, uh, they, they had much most worse outcomes than those who were in the control group. Now this, um, one of the in critical parts of the syphilis study is something that the, um, Patricia King, who's a bioethicist and lawyer at the Georgetown uh, Law Center talks about, and she talks about the dangers of difference. And that in a racist society that incorporates beliefs about the inherent inferiority of African Americans in contrast to the superior status of whites, any attention to the question of differences that may exist is likely to per be pursued in a manner that burdens rather than benefits African Americans. Now, why do I think that this is important? I mean, one of this uh, is important because if you look at this historical, historically, there's a long history of looking at biological differences and medical ideology. And I would even extend this to, uh, to political ideology. If you look at, for example, during the period of, of, of slavery, that there was a belief in innate racial differences and that, um, that you know, black people had different bodies that black people uh, had different anatomies, different physiologies, and that this difference was equated with inferiority. And if you think that these ideas are not around, there was a study that was done a couple of years ago at the University of Virginia, where medical students and residents thought that black people did not feel pain in the same way as, uh, as, as white people, and thus did not get pain treatments. The other thing is that racial susceptibilities, we still talk about this today. And so there was a, a belief in racial susceptibilities for diseases such as tuberculosis. For example, at the end of the Civil War, there was an increase in tuberculosis in African-Americans. Some people called it the Negro health problem. And it was a belief that it was because of the bodies of African-Americans were different and that the bodies of African-Americans were different and so that they, perhaps they were going to die out. And there was not a focus on some of the social factors that led to this increase in tuberculosis. And you see racial resistance to diseases such as malaria. And so that if African-Americans were resistant to malaria, then uh, soldiers, for example, during the Spanish-American War should, could, should be working in the trenches, digging ditches. And we now know that this racial resistance 
to uh, malaria might have been that uh, people had uh, sickle cell trait. And, and these, this belief in the differences in black bodies is critical to understanding the syphilis study. And that is because the study's design was predicated on an epidemiological finding, the wide disparity and patterns of disease between African-Americans and whites. And this is influenced by these medical beliefs about the peculiarities and susceptibilities of black bodies. There had been a study that was a retrospective study that looked uh, in Oslo that looked at uh, um, uh, latent syphilis and untreated, uh, untreated syphilis. Um, but the question is, what about uh, African-Americans? You see in the um, medical literature here in 1916 that, uh, that African-Americans were a notoriously syphilis race. And in 1932, one of the people who was involved in the, um, in the uh, creation of the syphilis study said syphilis in the Negro is in many aspects a different disease from syphilis in the whites. And, and, and the belief was that in terms of tertiary syphilis, that African-Americans had more of, of the cardiac manifestations of ter tertiary syphilis and white Americans had more of the, uh, of the neurological. The belief being that African-Americans, and I'm not making this up, that African-Americans did not use their brains as much. And so it didn't tax their brains. So they did not get the neurological uh, uh, sequela. What I have never seen is that, so if African-Americans had more cardiac uh, manifestations that they use their hearts more. So I never, um, never uh, have seen that. So the, the researchers use incentives that were culturally sensitive. And I think that this is critical because they use some of the most culturally sensitive procedures to obtain and maintain uh, the participation. One, they use black churches. Um, black, they did recruitment at black churches, black schools. They also knew that things such as burial funds was important to the African American community. So these were used to get participation. We use some of these same um, um, procedures today to try to get uh, um, recruitment of African Americans. And so I think that we have to be very careful about making sure we're not overstepping bounds. Now, one of the enduring myths of the syphilis study were that the men were injected with syphilis. The men were not injected with syphilis. Several years ago, I was on a radio show, talk radio, I don't like doing talk radio. Um, I was in a talk radio show in um, in uh, Chicago, and I, I said the men were not injected with syphilis. Somebody called up and, and said, and I was at the University of Wisconsin at the time, and the person said, well, you believe that because you've been in Wisconsin for too long. And I wanted to say, but I did not, I wanted to say, you keep this up, you really find out that I'm from West Philly, but I did not. But this myth about the men being injected with syphilis persists. For example, this is a, um, uh, from an article from 2017, where it said that the men were intentionally administered uh, syphilis and denied uh, treatment. Here is another from a book that just came out on, called The Organ Thieves. And it's like one example is the Tuskegee syphilis study in which the men, uh, African-American men were uh, recruited and given the painful fatal disease. Another article that was from uh, last month that was in the Harvard Business Review. Uh, unfortunately, I did not get the, uh, to this article before they did the correction, but they had a correction that said that, that the, uh, an earlier edition of the article incorrectly stated that the men had been purposely injected with syphilis. So this myth persists and many people still believe it. And I think that is one of the problems that we face when we talk about the syphilis study. So why Macon County? Why this particular county? Um, um, you see Booker T. Washington here, and then you see Robert uh, Moton who, uh, who became principal of Tuskegee Institute 
after um, uh, Booker T. Washington's death. And one of the things that Tuskegee wanted to do was spread the gospel of health. Um, the other thing that uh, Tuskegee did was that the first black woman who, who um, received a medical license by the Board of Medical Examiners of Alabama, Hallie Tanner Dillon Johnson, started a, a dispensary in Tuskegee to help take care of people in the county. The other thing is that there was something called National Negro Health Week, and it was launched uh, in 1915 uh, by uh, Booker T. Washington as a national movement, and that it promoted education and sanitation and public health uh, throughout the country. Um, and this was something that was in Tuskegee. And so when you talk about the Tuskegee syphilis study and use the word Tuskegee as shorthand for the syphilis study, I think it obscures work such as, uh, uh, as this. And the federal government in the 1930s took over uh, National Negro Health Week. There was a hospital, a nurse training school at Tuskegee at a time where most hospitals and nurse training schools did not accept black uh, uh, physicians and nurses. Uh, there also was a John A. Andrew Clinical Society where physician, black physicians went through the summer to get uh, postgraduate uh, training uh, at a time where they could not get it elsewhere. There was also a black veterans hospital that opened up in 1923. It was the first black veterans hospital uh, in the United States. And how it worked is that you, if you were a veteran and you needed, uh, depending on where uh, you lived, you would have to take the train to Tuskegee in order to get care. The argument being that uh, the, the government could not totally ignore the health care of black veterans, but to, they needed to provide it depending on the location and segregated facilities. Uh, Tuskegee also had a movable school, and so uh, which went around to uh, work on screening, uh, you know, public health, um, uh, nutrition, and so there was a public health infrastructure already in place at Tuskegee Institute before the initiation of the syphilis study. This is Thomas Parent who was uh, head of the venereal disease branch of the, uh, of the uh, uh, public health service. And he was Surgeon General from 1936 uh, to 1948. He has become a controversial figure because not only was he involved in um, uh, continuing the syphilis study, he was also involved with the uh, studies in Guatemala where people were injected with venereal diseases. And in fact, um, his name has been taken off the School of Public Health, which he started at the University of Pittsburgh. And then when he talked about, he wrote, he wrote a book called Shadow of the Land, Syphilis, and uh, talking about Macon County. And he talks about the poverty in Macon County, you know, the shacks, um, the, no um, rags for bed, bedding. And that in this county in 1929, that almost 40% of all age groups of the black community were positive for syphilis. And he later said, if one wished to study the natural history of syphilis in the Negro race, uninfluenced by treatment, I don't want to repeat that, uninfluenced by treatment because there is not a lot of treatment in Macon County, this county would be an ideal location for such a study. Um, this is um, Charles Johnson, uh, who's a sociologist. Um, he was first black president of Fisk University. His grandson is uh, Jay Johnson, who was head of Homeland Security in the o Obama administration. And he wrote a book called In the Shadow of the Plantation. And in the shadow of plantation, he is talking about Macon County. And in the next couple of slides, I just wanna show you some pictures of what Macon County looked like exclusive of Tuskegee Institute in 1930s. Ain't make nothing, don't expect nothing till I die. 
So this, you know, just gives, I think, some context to understanding the particular community of Macon County. So the study actually started as um, in January 1930, um, that if you look at the timeline, as a treatment study sponsored by the Julius Rosenwald Fund. Uh, it was a one year uh, a study and the Julius Rosenwald Fund was, this, uh, was uh, started by Julius Rosenwald, the president of, of, um, of Sears and uh, Sears and Roebuck. And he gave so much money to black causes that there was a, a rumor, and I heard this rumor growing up, that um, Roebuck was black, but Mr. Sears uh, took all his money. Um, and so, the, but it turns out that was a rumor uh, because of uh, uh, the, how much money Julius Rosenwald Fund gave to black causes. So this was a treatment study and the treatment study included men and women. When a decision, so there was already a screened population and in October 1932, when the study of untreated syphilis began, women were not included because of concerns of, about congenital syphilis. In 1936, the first report of, this, uh, of the study was published and 12 followed in medical journals. And I think this is critical because this was not a hidden study. It, it received, it was, uh, it was there were publications in, um, medical and public health journals about the syphilis study. So people knew about the syphilis study. Now this is, um, um, this picture here is one of the pictures of uh, when um, the, the, how it would work uh, is that the physicians from the public health service would come uh, annually for what they called roundups, their words. And this is someone, you know, getting um, a, a blood sample. But I have shown this picture uh, previously, and people have said, this shows it. This shows, this picture uh, confirms that the men were uh, given syphilis. So as I said, um, there were annual uh, visits uh, they, that uh, people would um, come to the, um, the people from the public health service would come to where people work and here in the cotton fields. That there is a uh, Eunice Rivers, a black uh, nurse who was associated with the, uh, the study. She's become emblematic of the role of black physicians and nurses in the study. Uh, her name is more known than the, the black physician, Eugene Dibble, who was more closely attached uh, uh, to the study. I think in large part because when the study broke, uh, he uh, was uh, uh, had died. Um, here she's giving um, this is Mr. Charles Pollard uh, some uh, medication. So the men were treated for things for for illnesses and conditions that were not associated with their syphilis. So you know there would be cardiac evaluations also x-ray evaluations to follow the course of the untreated syphilis. Um, this was um, you know, a lumbar puncture. And the men were told that the lumbar punctures were therapeutic, they were getting back shots and not diagnostic. So uh, in 1943, uh, the public health service began administering penicillin to civilians with syphilis. Uh, and, um, and, but the syphilis study continues. But as a historian of medicine, I think it's also critical to look back and to what was the treatment in 1930s. There was a treatment in 1930s. It was arsenic and uh, heavy metal compounds. You'd have to be treated for almost a year, but it did exist. And that was the, uh, the standard care in the 1930s. And so that, Yes, penicillin was more effective and more efficient, but you have to look at what was the therapeutics at the time. And if you look at the shadow of the land, syphilis, Perrin says that people with latent syphilis should be treated. And the goal of this study was to go to endpoint. And what endpoint was, was to autopsy. And I'm just going to, I'm not going to go talk about this a lot, but I just want to show some of the things that were happening uh, in the context of uh, research ethics, the Nazi uh, doctor's trials, uh, the Nuremberg Codes, which talks about permissible uh, medical experiment, uh, experiments. You know, in 20, you know, 
1958, the men received $25 and um, also a certificate for their grateful active participation in the uh, Tuskegee Medical Research Study. And the thing is active participation, meaning, but it does not show that they were uh, saying active participation does not say that the men knew what was going on. Just a, a, another um, uh, thing that happened in uh, event that happened in bioethics uh, is the Declaration of Helsinki. So in 1966 and 1969, Peter Buxton was a public health venereal disease worker in San Francisco. And he expressed grave concerns about the study uh, to uh, the CDC. He had heard about a, a black man in San Francisco who he was told should not be treated because he was a part of this particular study. But before Peter Buxton had uh, expressed his concerns, there was a group of black uh, public health workers in CDC who also tried to expose the study, um, uh, headed by um, uh, Bill Jenkins. And um, uh, Dr. Jenkins, what he did was they said they got a group of people together, they wrote what was happening, and then they sent their, uh, their findings to newspapers uh, and expected something to happen. Not, uh, nothing happened. Um, happened. So, um, and while, you know, you know, this people are starting to like get uneasy about the syphilis study within um, the CDC, in, in 1966, the Department of Health Education and Welfare, it issued policies for the protection of human subjects and research. None of these changes in bioethics or research ethics had any impact on the men in the syphilis study. Um, because of the actions of, you know, or I might say better way of saying the agitation of Peter Buxton uh, in 1969, a CDC committee with one dissent voted to continue the study. Why uh, was this decision made to continue the study? One, um, that there was a belief that uh, this was the last time um, they, they had, that uh, public health uh, 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 um, authorities would have the ability to do such a, a long-term study. Um, there also was concerns that if the study was revealed that, um, that people would be upset, there would be uh, um, uh, criticism of the study. They were actually correct about that. And, the, um, and so the study continued. In July of 1972, the Associated Press um, released a study um, about the um, about the uh, an article about the study after uh, Peter Buxton released uh, uh, leaked the study. He leaked the study to uh, Jean Heller, who was a reporter at the. Uh, at the, uh, uh, for the Associated Press. Um, this was the first public revelation of the syphilis study. And I like to make a distinction between what I referred to earlier in terms of it being in uh, public health journals and medical journals to this public, um, uh, this, uh, uh, public revelation in the newspaper. Uh, when I talked to Jean Heller, she said that one of the most controversial parts of this article was the word syphilis was on the front page of a newspaper. Um, times have definitely changed. Um, but the, the thing is, I read about this the following day in the New York Times. And I wrote my um, senior thesis on the syphilis study. So I have been milking my senior thesis for about uh, 50 years, my friends like uh, uh, to point out. But for me, my work on the syphilis study, it really has impacted my life's work in terms of looking at the impact of race and racism on, uh, in medical care, but also to, the, to underscore the importance of African-American voices. Um, after the study uh, was released, I mean, and, and one of the things too um, is that when Mr. Pollard um, found out about the study by reading it in the newspaper, 
he got himself a lawyer. And so uh, in his action, as soon as he found out, I, I think dispels this whole thing about the men being vulnerable. You know, they, they, they were in vulnerable situations that they could make uh, uh, decisions also. So that um, the uh, 1970, August 1972, the Department of Health and Education and Welfare appointed a committee to review uh, the study um, and the uh, Senate held hearings and um, uh, the following year. And almost a year later, health, education and welfare authorized treatment, but many of the men, when they found out, went and got treatment. And the report, the final report found the study was ethically unjustified, especially after the introduction of penicillin. So there was a lawsuit. Um, a $1.8 million lawsuit was filed on behalf of the participants. Um, the following year, there was a settlement uh, was reached and uh, Mr. Fred Gray, who was the attorney for the men said that uh, they went uh, for the settlement because the men were getting older. Um, the government could have kept uh, kept this up. And each living uh, um, participant received 37,500. Another way of looking at this is almost like um, $1,000 a year for the 40 years that some of them were in the study. And this led to uh, the National Research Act, which required IRBs at institutions receiving federal funding and which led to the National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects of Biomedical and Behavioral Research. And those of you in, in bioethics, you know, know this as the Belmont um, uh, principles of beneficence, respect for persons, and justice, which came out because um, of the, uh, the um, problems with the syphilis study. So um, one of the things I got involved with in January of 1996 was um, this committee called the Tuskegee Syphilis Study Legacy Committee, because we saw how the syphilis study was often used as the reason that uh, African-Americans did not participate in clinical trials, that African-Americans uh, did not uh, um, uh, accept some HIV AIDS um, um, uh, medications. So we met in Tuskegee in January of 1996. Uh, and our goals were, you know, that we were going to get an apology from the federal government. And at the meeting, and I got to be chair because I, I got the, had the biggest mouth. Um, uh, at the meeting, there were some people who said, oh, does it really matter? Does the syphilis study really matter? And sometimes there's divine intervention. And the meeting was on a Thursday. And um, at that time, um, in the black community at least, the number one show was a show called New York Undercover. Why white Americans might have been looking at friends, black people were watching New York Undercover. And on that show, between the Thursday and Friday meeting, it was about the syphilis study. It was it was historically inaccurate, but I knew that the next day that in black barber shops and beauty salons and on black talk radio that the syphilis study was going to be uh, addressed. And so why did we think it was an apology needed? It was because of the physical harms to the people of Macon County, the, un, the, um, the disgrace that the study brought to Tuskegee University and Macon County community, and the contribution to the fears and abuse and expo exploitation by government officials and the medical profession. And finally, even though there had been a, this lawsuit, no apology had ever been made by a government official. And the year before, there had been apology for the people who were in the human radiation experiments. And so our goal was to get this apology uh, and try to develop a strategy to redress the, the damages caused by the study. So on um, May uh, 1997, there was an apology given. Um, I was there in the audience. And when President Clinton said, the American people are sorry, uh, there were audible sobs in the audience. And I think in large part, because this was not just the pain of the victims of the study, but some, but it also represented the pain of many uh, African Americans. And um, uh, one of the things that happened, it took two years for this to get this apology, but that we also were able to uh, 
uh, uh, get it in large part because the men themselves had asked for the apology. So this is uh, uh, President Clinton and Vice President Gore uh, and uh, David Satcher and the men who were able to make it uh, to the uh, White House ceremony. And, and there, you know, I am and I never knew I could grin so much. And I'm just gonna leave it at that. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Ernest Hendon was the uh, last uh, uh, member of the, who was involved in the syphilis study, and he died in 2004 at the age of 96. So what's the legacy of the syphilis study? Um, and Mr. Shaw, uh, who, was, who spoke for the men, uh, said that the damage done by the syphilis study is much deeper than the wounds any of us have suffered. Uh, and then, um, uh, President Clinton and his remarks, he talked about the syphilis study uh, uh, being um, an example of a broken trust and the need to rebuild this, uh, uh, this trust and to do more to ensure that medical research practices are sound and ethical and that researchers work more closely with communities. So what's trust? You know, on this basic level, it's a belief that individuals and institutions will act appropriately and perform competently, responsibly, and in a manner considered to our interests. There's no universal definition of trust, which leads to problems of conceptual models and measurement as implications of research and policy and monitoring. But the other thing about trust, it's a dynamic, fragile process. And there's you know, different categories of trust, interpersonal tr uh, trust between individuals such as a physician, and usually comes from direct experience with someone. A social trust, it refers to trust in collective institutions. So one might not trust your hospital, but you trust your physician. So they are not you know, mutually exclusive. And a large part of this social trust comes from media portrayals, collective uh, 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 relationships, and historical experiences. So, I mean, race in terms of looking at race, trust and medical care and distrust can lead to adversely affect health outcomes. You know, racial and ethnic minorities have lower levels of trust and there's racial concordance between patient and provider is positively correlated with trust. Meaning that if, you know, you have a black physician that a black patients, somehow they trust their black physicians are more than sometimes with their white physician. And so these are some of the things that trust, you know, decreased trust has been associated with, you know, lower patient satisfaction, lower uh, adherence to treatments, disenrollment from health plans, um, not being involved in uh, research uh, uh, ethics. You know, um, about 5% of, I've heard 5% of um, studies have African-American. And so it has a negative impact on health equity, equity research, but also in terms of care. And so these are some of the uh, African-Americans perceptions of healthcare in terms of, of trust. So one of the questions I've been interested in is what's the impact of the uh, public health service and, uh, uh, and distrust? I mean, this is um, uh, from, um, uh, um, from a study where this woman said, I don't, but I don't know how most people are, but it reminds me of the Tuskegee in Institute where they messed around and they made the brothers have the dis disease of, uh, instead of treating them. And this is from David Satcher when he was, he was doing some work on uh, Alzheimer's disease and why there needs to be more African-Americans in clinical trials. And he says, this fear of clinical trials dates to a dark history and our shared history, the Tuskegee syphilis uh, experiments. As much as uh, I admire David Satcher, I think he's wrong on this one. And I think the reason why he's wrong or that he, these other studies that, that say it's the syphilis study, these are all, I mean, I have on my Google scholars, the syphilis study, and these are all studies that said that uh, talk about the role of the syphilis study. And I think that they're wrong in part because that this distrust in the African-American community predated the syphilis study. As a historian, I did an article, and that's one of your readings, um, that to, to look at attitudes before the syphilis study. For example, experimentation on slaves. 
the desecration of black graves for cadavers after the Civil War, fears about hospitalization in the early 20th century. This is uh, from, written by uh, a, a black woman physician and public health person, Virginia Alexander. And she did this qualitative and quantitative study of uh, healthcare in North Philadelphia. And one patient talked about she would not go to a hospital for an operation. She was afraid because they always tell you that you need an operation when you don't, and then you can't have any babies. This is from a 1941, from an article by John Kenney, who was Booker T. Washington's physician. And he talks about uh, the contributions of African-Americans to surgery. He talks about surgeons and hospitals, but he also has a section called guinea pigs. And in this section, he talks about the untold, uh, untold thousands of African-Americans who have been used to promote the cause of science and, and how they were treated. And he suggests that there should be uh, a monument dedicated to the nameless Negroes who have contributed so much to surgery by the guinea pig route. So, I mean, I, I think that, you know, so that the syphilis, so this uh, distrust predated the syphilis study, the empirical research on the direct influence of the syphilis studies is equivocal. There's some research that says it does impact, others says it does not. Um, but I think that part of the legacy, it is used as the most prominent example of medical racism because it confirms, if not authenticated, long held and deeply entrenched beliefs. And I should also add experiences within the African-American community. Um, and so there's research that is not, and it's not just African-Americans, I just want to point this out, because, you know, in, um, the question is whether it's distrust or trustworthiness. The article that you're going to read, I use the word uh, distrust, um, and I think the word should be trustworthiness. And um, there's an article by LaVera Crawley, where she's talking about situating trust and trustworthiness. And she said, by you, keeping using the word distrust or mistrust, it becomes almost like an inherent trait of African-Americans, as opposed to asking the questions, what have we done to gain trust? And that by focusing on trustworthiness, it shifts the onus to healthcare institutions and healthcare professionals. And the other thing is there are African-Americans who participate in clinical trials. And I think that we need to ask ourselves, why do they contribute to, um, to clinical trials? And one being uh, Helene Cooper, who is Lisa Cooper's cousin, uh, who's volunteered uh, to be in a COVID-19 uh, vaccine here um, at uh, George Washington University. And so there's this call for, you know, we need in, uh, to recruit more Black Americans to vaccine trials. And this is from uh, the four uh, heads of the HBCU medical schools. So building trustworthy relationships. Now, it's not easy. I have been giving talks about trust and tr for about 30 years now, and I'm still giving them. So I think we have to ask ourselves, what are we doing wrong? So here are some thoughts uh, that I have to, to end of uh, that, you know, that African-Americans are not inherently mistrustful. And most have trust in medicine and biomedical uh, research. Um, but, um, but we also have to understand the importance of respect for community attitudes and history. And I'm going to say something controversial here, that many times I think that the, the, that the attitudes of trust of African-Americans have nothing to do with the syphilis study that it's the uh, syphilis study becomes shorthand. And I also think it gives people an out, oh, it's the a syphilis study. I think it has a lot more to do in particular communities about community histories. Um, you, know, um, you know, at Penn, where I was born, went to medical, uh, and went to medical school, um, is that uh, being a, a resident of West Philadelphia, that the distrust between Penn and um, the University of Pennsylvania might more have to do with how Mrs. Jones was treated at the clinic. It might also have to do with the fact that the Penn police were involved in, um, 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 in quelling dis uh, unrest in West Philadelphia uh, recently. Uh, after the killing of George Floyd has might also have to do with the fact that 
black homes were destroyed in order to expand the university uh, city uh, center. So, um, and so I think that, you know, Hopkins has his history of, you know, about Henrietta Lacks. So I think we also have to think about if we keep saying it's Tuskegee, it might obviate our looking at other causes. Uh, I think the other thing is that in trustworthy relationships, the impact of, of structural uh, of factors that, you know, when COVID uh, um, uh, was shown to be you know, disproportionate in uh, African Americans, you know, there was someone asked me, well, why can't we get them to uh, socially distance as opposed to thinking, well, maybe you can't socially distance if you're on the front line uh, delivering uh, 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 someone's food. And I think there's a need for community engagement and consultation uh, during all stages. Uh, the other thing is the need to, um, to demonstrate the benefits of research to uh, the community all, you know, as a continuous process that, you know, that, you know, that it has to be longstanding and not at a time where there is an emergency. And so the acknowledgement that, you know, when you, that, you know, partners in research bring expertise, um, the, you understand, trying to understand the priorities and exp, uh, expectations of each partner. Um, and the other thing, the, the importance of frequent continuous communications, and also the identification of factors that influence trust, both positively and negatively. So I want to end here uh, talking about the syphilis study, because I think it's important to understand the syphilis study, to understand it correctly. Uh, and I think is not to remember the syphilis study, as uh, George uh, Silver, uh, a public health physician said, um, is to forget and to forget is a disservice to those who suffer the indignities. And finally, my final slide here, I think that sometimes when we talk about studies, that we forget that people are involved. Um, this here is Fred Tyson, who was uh, in the study with his granddaughter, Carmen Head, who has uh, dedicated her life to public health, uh, and that uh, that sometimes that you know that Mr. Tyson's life was not just about being in a study, but that he was also a grandfather who loved having his grandbaby on his lap. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vanessa. This was so wonderful. Um, a lot of uh, nice comments. I would like to invite uh, questions from the audience, probably the best way, unless, okay, Otis, I'll, yeah. you have the floor. And if someone else has a question, please type it in and we'll make sure to get uh, to it if we can. I, I want to thank Dr. Northington Gamble. And uh, by full disclosure, I've known her for, can I say, more than 25 years. We worked together uh, in the mid 1990s in the work up to the apology when I uh, was assigned from the NCI to work for Surgeon General Satcher. I, I wanna just ask a question and sort of make a comment. There's one word you didn't say, and it's something that has motivated me for the last 30 years. And uh, some people are actually gonna understand me after I ask this question, and that's paternalism. Mm -hmm. uh, in, you know, I'm a prostate cancer doc, mm -hmm. and so frequently uh, over the last 30 years, uh, half of which we, well, actually 20 of that 30 years, we had no study to show that prostate cancer screening saved lives. Um, and even after we had that, all the major organizations say men should be told of the potential risks and the potential benefits of prostate cancer screening and they should be encouraged to make a choice. But very frequently I hear, well, black men have more prostate cancer than white men, and they can't really understand what we're trying to convey to them. So we should just encourage them to get screened anyway. And some people who are offering the screening don't even understand that there's this question about whether people should get it and what the professional organizations say. And some of them out of pure ignorance are encouraging men to get screened. The paternalism actually, I think, justifies the distrust. 
I, you know, I, 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 you're absolutely correct, Otis. I did not use the word paternalism, but I think I kind of alluded to it when I said that the men were, uh, were seen not to be able to understand, that um, they weren't given a choice. Um, they were seen as, you know, illiterate, you know, so given the information, they would not know what to do with it. Um, but I said, as soon as uh, Mr. Pollard found out that he was in this study, he went and hired himself a lawyer. So he understood certain things. So mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I, I agree with you. I did not use that term, but I think that, you know, I did allude to it. Well, I'll stop after this. I just gave you a 2020 example of why black people should distrust us mm -hmm. because this prostate cancer screening paternalism is happening today. Right, you know, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, and the thing is that, you know, you know, that I think that in terms of some of the things around distrust, it that it should spur people to ask particular questions. And one of the things, I, I, there is a slide that I, I, I skipped over because uh, uh, that I probably should not have skipped over, um, is that, that people have to also be careful to think that just because somebody is black does not necessarily mean that they are going, that you also have to ask questions of black physicians too. Um, we have a minute for another question. Um, maybe Dina? Um, Dr. Northampton Gamble, I have had some interesting conversations with Otis and talk, you mentioned that movies that have taken place about Tuskegee. And one was Ms. Egbert's voice. Uh-huh. She authored papers? Yes. What, do you, what can you tell us about the role she played on that team that she would end up on a byline um, on a couple papers? So, I mean, she ended up on a, 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 a byline. Uh, so, does, so did uh, Eugene Dibble, who was head of of Tuskegee, uh, uh, the hospital at Tuskegee, John A. Andrew. So they, so they both ended up on bylines. They were critical to the study, especially Eunice Rivers. Um, that she was, you know, I, I said that the people from the public health service came like yearly, but she was the person for most of the study who was there. Um, the men doesn't do not talk ill of her. Um, and, um, and they trusted her. Uh, and then people say, well, why didn't she do anything about it? She was a black nurse in uh, rural Alabama. So, I mean, I, her, her power uh, was, you know, was limited. But I th do think that her involvement and the involvement of Tuskegee Institute and also of Eugene Dibble, you know, ask questions about, you know, what should be the role of African-Americans. So, so uh, Paul Cornelli, who I think many of you know, Paul Cornelli was the first black president of the American Public Health Association. So I got to talk with Dr. Cornelli before he died. And I asked him about the syphilis study. I said, Dr. Cornelli, I know you knew about it. Uh, those of you don't, who don't know Dr. Cornelli, he was a civil rights activist. He was, uh, uh, he was working for uh, desegregation. And he and I had talked for three hours. And he said, Gamble, I ask myself that question all the time. Why didn't I do anything about it? And he says, I think my maker is going to ask me that question. And one of the things that I have to say to myself is I saw it as research. And so somehow this person who's a civil rights activist somehow had a different vision when it was <clears throat> research. And so, um, so that um, Eunice Rivers, she was, a part of, she was a part of the team. I don't know how much she wrote, but she, there are a couple of articles with her name on it. Uh, if we have a second for one last question, if you don't mind, um, how can we grow the pool of researchers from the African-American community in public health and how can we increase the pipeline? I mean, that's a question that needs more than one, you know, one minute. Um, I think that uh, people are try striving uh, to do that, you know, in, in different ways. You know, I work with programs in terms of high school students, you know, junior high school students and getting them 
interested uh, in science. Um, so, but that's, uh, that's only a part of it. I mean, right now, you know, in terms of COVID-19, I think that we are living through something that is gonna have a major impact on kids who are interested in public health and research. If you are home and you don't have an internet connection, or if the school, you know, or you have to take care of, of, uh, of other people, that, you know, your, your, your siblings, that you're not gonna be able to learn you know, um, uh, successfully. And so that getting more people in the pipeline has to do not with just the pipeline, but the conditions under which children, especially black children in this country learn. Mm, what a wonderful last note. Thank you so much from all of us. And uh, uh, thank you for this inspiring and wonderful launch to our series. And um, We'll be keeping this in mind as we come back at four o'clock to continue our conversation. Thank you well, so thank much. Thank you for having me. Thank we you. really enjoyed it. It was an honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.